Ladies and gentlemen, the program is about to begin. Please take a moment to silence your mobile devices. We would like to remind you that food and drink are not permitted in the theater. Also, please note that photography and audio and video recording is prohibited. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kulaga, Executive Creative Director of the New York Times Live Conversation Series, Time Talks. For 20 years, Times Talks has paired New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of music, art, literature, social justice, politics, film, and tonight, theater. I'm delighted to welcome you to this conversation with the Tony Award winning, uh, Tony Olivier Emmy and Golden Globe Award winning uh, actor Brian Cranston in conversation with Tony and Olivier Award winning director Eva Van Hova. The duo will discuss Network, the immersive stage adaptation of the classic 1976 film that has just opened on Broadway following an acclaimed run at London's National Theatre. Moderating tonight's event is Dave Itzkoff, cultural reporter for the New York Times, who writes frequently about film, television, and comedy. He is the author of four books, including Robin, a biography of Robin Williams, and Mad as Hell, The Making of Network and the Fateful Vision of the Angriest Man in Movies. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our moderator, Dave Itzkoff, and our special guests, Brian Cranston and Eva Van Hova. Nice to see you. you want to see? Hello. Hello, hello. Wow. Thank you. Brian, Evo, it's really a, a pleasure to uh, sit down with both of you again. It's an honor to be able to share a stage with you for, for any amount of time. So thank you for uh, being here tonight. Oh, thank our you. pleasure. Uh, this is sort of my one and only chance to sound as smart as the two of you because I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a, a network uh, file and, and I just wanted to give folks a little bit of context for things that we may or may not discuss in the course of the evening. But uh, the film, when it was released in 1976, was incendiary but also uh, wildly popular. It won uh, four Oscars, including for Peter Finch, who played uh, the Howard Beale character. Uh, and it also won uh, an Oscar for its screenwriter, uh, Paddy Chayefsky. Uh, it was his third Oscar, and uh, even though the film is brilliantly directed by Sidney Lumet, it's very much uh, Chayefsky's movie. It embodied all of his cynicisms and uh, fears and uh, his dire uh, prophecies about what was going to happen to the news business as it became more of a business. And he, uh, he died in 1981, uh, long before many of his uh, predictions came true. Uh, I, I know you both saw the movie in its uh, original release, and I wondered, you know, what you remember, uh, if at all, about the movie in that era and that experience for, for the two of you. Well, I thought it was shocking and funny. I, I, I took it as the satire that I thought it was intended to be and um, enjoyed the the dystopian world that he drew up and and the I bless you but the idea that, <laughs> the idea that that it could turn in the news could turn into that I'm of the age where I was raised with uh, Walter Cronkite and Harry Reasoner and all those old guard guys and it never occurred to me at all during my youth and growing up into them, watching them into my adulthood that there was a manipulation of the news that, and there was, of course. Yeah. Now we realize that, that even in those days, someone was determining what items they wanted to talk about and what items they didn't have time for. And even an altruistic uh, straight arrow journalist might have some subliminal feelings about what he, probably he in those days, is more attracted to or what fits his ideology more clearly. And you realize that's what he's putting on the teleprompter for Walter Cronkite to read. And it was, wow. Yeah. And so it was, it was evident then, but it just wasn't so overt. And now it's, it's so clearly a, a, a circus 
<laughs> environment. Yeah. You, Speaking as a newspaper man, of course, uh, you know, we don't have, uh, we don't worry about such uh, time constraints. We know we have infinite space and infinite time. Well, you have all the news yeah. that's fit to print. It, exactly. Right? Oh. <laughs> it sounds good. I like that. I like that. We might use that. Right. Yeah. I, I get a little vague on that yeah. one, Andrew. <laughs> Evo, how about for you? What was the, uh, you know, wh what uh, remains with you about the experience of the movie, if, if anything? Well, I live in another part of the world, huh? yeah. Europe. And at that time, I was like a young man, I must have been 15, 16. And I saw that movie, I remember it very vividly. And for us, it was like crazy America. <laughs> you know, like, this is never going to happen in our country, you know. Uh, uh, so it felt like really science fiction, something that uh, was amazing. The movie was amazing on itself. It was like very theatrical, which attracted me a lot, of course, <laughs> uh, at that time. Uh, and it was a, kind of a different movie than we were used to see at that moment. So that was very attractive, uh, uh, the style of it and the, and even the acting in it, which was a little bit over the top at, its, at certain moments, very... Uh, not like we knew that movies were, eh, that the acting in movies were. But uh, the other side was like, we thought, that, well, this can never happen. Yeah. You know, and now, of course, it's the, the thing that now we live in the reality of what we felt was science fiction not that long ago. Absolutely. Uh, when you were approached by the National Theater to, you know, just uh, the, may, maybe you'd like to direct this, uh, you know, how, how, what attracted you about it or what sort of caught your, uh, your, your interest? Well, it started already in 2013 when the National Theater, uh, I, I just did a uh, view from the bridge at uh, the Young Vic in London and Rufus Norris, artistic director of the National Theater, he was going to be the new artistic director of the National Theater, started to talk about, uh, with me about being uh, a project. I said, yes, I'm interested, but we need a project. I'm not going to say I come without anything, you know? So we started to talk and a lot of things passed. And then at a certain moment, he had discovered that I did, had done already a lot of movies on stage. Uh, and then he said, well, would you be interested in network? And for me, this, this memory came back like, yes, but this is over the top. Why do this, you know? But then I said, well, let me read the script. And there was already a first version made by Lee Hall. Uh, who did the adaptation. It was the first version. And I read it, and I immediately saw huge potential there uh, um, in a way that needed to be uh, dealt with, with a lot of things that were not, uh, like, for instance, the terrorist scenes. You know, In the original uh, uh, movie, there were terrorist scenes. And there, the terrorists were described a little bit as, not a little bit, uh, just described as in it for the money because it was the Patty Hearst uh, time, you know, and it was the time that terrorists were something different from today. I said, well, to Lee Hall, well, that's for me unacceptable to, to talk today about terrorists, to be it in it for the money. No, they want to kill us yeah. because of an ideology, because they want a different world. That's a different thing from wanting money, you know? So these things that bothered me a little bit in the script, and we talked about it, and I... Uh, I said, well, if you're, if you're open to talk about this and to make changes about this, then I'm in. And then, of course, the second thing was immediately like, but this can only be done if I have somebody who can be Howard Beale. Right. And then his name was there immediately. <laughs> and he, he happened to be in London. <laughs> and we met in London uh, uh, but some time ago because uh, we met in London and... I immediately felt also with you that you had some kind of an interest immediately <laughs> and also the same a little bit doubts about, yes, but we have to, to look at the material and, uh, you know, it has to be. So, but, and then the calendars didn't fit very well between the two of us and then it took two years before we, but that was actually uh, something because Trump was not there when we were talking about it. <laughs> and suddenly was, Trump was there, and it made that. even more sense to do this. <laughs> you know, even in London, it made more sense to yeah. do it. So it was like a blessing in disguise, actually, the way it was. But it's delayed, yeah. 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 <laughs> From your end, Brian, uh, I mean, just to go back to the sort of the, the, the 2013 you, and when you were approached about it or just asked about it, what, uh, what was of interest to you? Well, uh, I first heard of it, it was um, 
February of 15. Oh, okay. And uh, I was in London on a movie, and uh, we share the same agent, and so we had some inside information. He said, <laughs> Evo's doing, uh, I'd just seen View from the Bridge and right. loved it, and, and so uh, we met and we talked about it, and I wanted to make sure that, that we were talking about playing Howard and not Max, because I, I, I have a, I have a, <laughs> I have a keen interest in playing very damaged people. <laughs> <laughs> That's an understatement. I, I, <laughs> if they're not severely damaged, it's like mm, I don't know. <laughs> because for me, it's actually uh, it's actually a way to live therapeutically, right. you know, and, and purge all my own demons on stage, and it's. it's it's fun to do, but you know, I mean, beside that, that kind of right. side you want, benefit. Um, <laughs> you want to make sure you're the guy who loses his mind and not the guy who tries to pull him back from the brink. That, well, yeah, but I see, I don't, I, I don't think you can approach Howard Beale from a, a standpoint of him actually going mad. Um, I don't know how you would play mad. I, I, I wanted to, to play him as a person who, who did had an, have an epiphany and was enlightened. And he's excited about sharing that enlightenment and telling the truth and, and shedding all the, the, the lies that he's been a part of in, in doing broadcast like that and, um, and walk that line. So we wanted to, talking with Evo about how to do that and to allow the audience uh, to make up their minds one way or the other, and whichever way the audience feels that he is, either he's mad or he's actually a, a very enlightened being and something did happen to him, it's, it's really up to you. And that really, once Evo w was eager to, to walk that line, it really drew me in because I have that philosophy of the, of, of the audience is always right. right. And they are, they're always right. Whatever the audience is feeling, they're always right. If it, and it's uh, the job of the performers and the director and the writers to be able to tell a story and, and be the leader on the vanguard of telling a story and hopefully in the, in the direction that you would love the audience to go. But if audience members don't go that way, they go this way, that's okay too. And they're right to go that way. And so you can never argue with someone, an audience member, of if they didn't feel something. It, they, then they didn't. Yeah. It, it's not. It's it, it's not their fault. It's our fault. Had, had you done uh, all the way at that point? Had that already? Yes, yeah, so I had already finished um, all the way right. in. Uh, um, 14? 14, 2014. And I mean, that was a play, I mean, if people don't know, I mean, that's of course a, a play about uh, Lyndon Johnson and uh, you, I think you're pretty much physically on stage for the duration of that show, is that right? If I remember. I think there was two times that I was off for about a minute and a right, half or right. something like that. Oh, okay. Three hour play. Right. Yeah, I mean, just a massive commitment of you know, energy and, and endurance and I mean, did that, that must have given you, I imagine, a lot of confidence uh, about, you know, what you're, you're capable of, particularly as a, as a stage actor, after an experience like that. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's confidence or ignorance. Um, uh, <laughs> but you feel like you, you I, I hope that I would have had the confidence to do it before I did it. You know, it's like, <laughs> I have the confidence that this parachute is going to open. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I've, I don't know. For most actors, um, the, the only thing that you really hope that you achieve in the course of your career is opportunity. Um, we'll, we'll meet for a role, we'll audition for a role, that's what we're used to, but if an actor doesn't have opportunity, they can't move. So uh, that was the only thing that, that I was looking for when I was doing whatever I was doing. And the only thing that I knew instinctively without any formal training in, in acting whatsoever, um, was it's the writer. Look for the written word. Attach yourself to the well-written word and you won't be dissatisfied. Something may not achieve 
uh, a level of success at a box office or critical acclaim or whatever, but I think, and you could also mess that up too, but, but at least that's your foundation, and it always is. It's always the writing. How does that story move you? Is it relevant? Is it important? Did, did, it, did it get under your skin? Did you think about it? I always read something and then put it away. And if it stays with me, it's a great sign. If it scares me a little bit, that's also a good sign. Yeah, yeah. Evo, the previous plays that you have directed uh, on Broadway prior to the network were both uh, revivals, very, uh, you know, uh, stylized and, and uh, unique revivals of Arthur Miller plays, The Crucible and A View from the Bridge. Do you see any, you know, parallels or connections between Miller and Chayefsky? Are they very uh, different yeah. kinds of writers? The, yeah, I, I think I see. Uh, they talk about America, but they, what I like about both of them is that uh, they, they, they talk about very specific individuals and their individual lives and their individual problems and traumas and wishes and these are, you know. And at the same time, it's, a, it, it, it's about a society and how this influences a society and how it, uh, uh, things that are happening in a society in influences an individual. And I think that's what, 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 what I like also in theater. That's what I like also about Shakespeare, yeah. for instance, that it's always very, about, very much about individuals, but there is always uh, a, a, a bigger picture there. And that's what I like in theater. So, and I think any network you have that, and in The Crucible and The View from Bridge, you have these elements. Yeah. Certainly the, the, the motion picture of, of Network and its screenplay, they're fairly cynical. They're not, uh, not too upbeat, I think, on the prospects for you know, humanity. And a lot of the, there's a dark comedy that comes from that. But I don't necessarily sense that's how you but got into it. But I consider it not as cynical, but as realistic yeah. in this case. And, and, and Brian was referring to it. For us, it was very important. That, that's a big change towards uh, uh, the, the, the movie, that is that in the movie, the, the, the leading character, he swoons already after a few scenes. So that's a man clearly not himself, being himself. Yeah. We skipped that and, and, uh, and to keep uh, us really interested in what Howard Beale has to say and not only in how he says it, you know? And that was for us the biggest challenge uh, in this production because I think, Brian, you have uh, six, seven speeches, or you know, basically your part is uh, a lot of speeches, or to the camera, or to the audience, and uh, we took them every speech. We took it serious. We tried to figure out together what it was about, but also how we were going to do it. The speech, and we uh, we sat for a week. I will remember these uh, sessions forever in my life. Mm -hmm. For a whole week in the mornings, we were almost alone with a small crew only there. And we were sitting at the table, which I never do. You know, I never, I'm not such a talker. You know, I'm much more like, yeah. But, but I felt this time, this was the best way to get where we had have to go together. And we talked a lot and we talked about what it meant, what these speeches meant, why this speech is different from the other, why is there another one? And anyway, you know, what does it tell? Oh, it tells this. And also how we were going to do it. We were just, talking and then we rehearsed it just a little bit like indicating it, I remember that. And then we really did it in the theater itself, then you really did it. So I loved that moment. But it was important to get away from the... Uh, the movie was of course a fabulous satire. Uh, in, and I made the choice to make it into a tragedy. And that's what, what was the switch in mood and in sensibility and in also the acting, the way that you have to, to deal with it. Oh, it's a tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> a tragedy where you can laugh. Tomorrow I'm going to be very no, different. No, no, no. <laughs> Let's call it a tragic comedy. <laughs> Brian, for you... He's I mean, impossible to work with. <laughs> 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 Did 
did, did you feel at all? I mean, I, have, having seen it, I don't, I don't think, I, I mean, your performance is entirely its own thing. It doesn't, I don't think, owe anything to, uh, you know, the version of it that people might be uh, familiar with. But approaching this, did you feel, you know, any, any uh, you know, anxiety at all about the fact that the, you know, if there's anything that people know from the movie, it's Peter Finch saying, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And that, for an actor, I can imagine is, uh, you know, you, you, you don't want to sort of live in the shadow of that. You want to make your own thing. How do you, you know, start to tackle uh, an assignment like that? Um, again, I, I'd have to go back to ignorance. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really want to know too much about what someone else did with something. And I look at, at creating a character like um, like you're picking out a bouquet of flowers. You you go and you make selections, and you have to just continue take it. And what you may th have thought you wanted early on, as it, you get into rehearsals, it, you know what? This really doesn't serve me anymore. I'm going to put that back. And uh, so you're constantly making changes, and you never know what you're going to come up with, in in really any given night. Like for instance, the Mad as Hell speech has changed from when you saw it. Oh, wow. I guess I have to see it again. <laughs> uh, there's a, the, I, I, um, I, I don't know how to, you know, there's a term, you know, they're going to, the play is frozen, yeah. that kind of thing. I don't, I don't know really what that means because we're different. We're a day older. The next day you do it. You're alive on stage. Someone may have a cold. Someone may, do, and he embraces that. It's not to discard all the work you did with the director, with the staging, with it. It's not to throw all that out, but it's just to allow a space to have something spontaneous come to you. Try it, and and you may find, man, that doesn't work. And so <laughs> I'm I, I'm not going to do that anymore. And so, but. You also may find that it enhances the next moment, which then just really sings, and you can feel the audience push back in their seats. Or something. It's really, it's that's why actors love to do theater. It's like you get that opportunity every night to tell a complete story, a beginning, middle, and end. And in the movie business, we're in the bits and pieces business. We we do little bits and pieces every day, and. You don't have the same experience when you're shooting a film as when you're working on stage. Yeah. You just don't. You can't. You can have a very wonderful visceral experience after the fact. Seeing the movie when it's completed, you could be emotionally taken away by it. But actually doing it, it's very different. Yeah. Do you find still that you have to uh, you know, pace yourself over the course of a, of a performance in terms of how much of your energy you expend, your emotion. Yeah. I mean, it's such a challenge, it would seem. I do. Um, I, I stop eating uh, halfway through the day, and then I just start drinking hot water and cold water, pretty much. And I just drink water all the way through. And then I'll, I'll look for opportunities throughout the play where I can sit, just to rest. Yeah. Um, and because this character, I have to, I, I, I don't, I have an on off switch. I don't have, oh, I'm just going to give it a little. I can't do that. I'm working with a vocal coach who was trying to say, well, go ahead and use your, your, your diaphragmatic voice, you know. Oh, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it. And I thought, oh, no, no, I don't. <laughs> it didn't, it didn't feel right to right. me. You know? So I have, so. I probably should have done that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but um, you know, I'm 62 now, and I, I have to. I, I I don't leave the theater on two show days. I just stay in. I try to yeah. come down off the the adrenaline of the first show, and then lie down and try to take a nap, and then then start to gear up again for it because it's it's a workout. It's much harder to do a Broadway schedule than it is to do like 14, 15 hours on a movie set. It's much harder. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, you were talking about voice before, and uh, just in playing Beale, you, you know, you, you use a voice that 
is not necessarily your own. I mean, it's coming from right. you, of course, but it's a little different than I think we're used to hearing you. Uh, right. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's got a, a kind of a clenched, almost a, this is kind of authoritative voice. I just wonder if you could talk a, you know, a little bit about where that comes from or how you well, developed that. Well, I, I, it just kind of, as we were rehearsing it in London, um, I was thinking of all those those very influential um, newscasters who I would watch, and and I thought that the the common denominator among them is that they earn their living really on their voice, and you could you could you could shape your voice to have timber and <laughs> and gravitas. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to just just get him down into a into a, a vocal area where it's a little gravelly. Yeah. And so Howard Howard Beale talks like that, you know. <laughs> it's September 19th. This is Howard Beale. You know, there's there's a there's a a sense of it's it feels like it might be important. Yeah. And 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 I was thinking I think Howard Beale wanted to discover and train his voice to sound important like what I'm about to tell you. You know. Yeah. So I just played with that. <laughs> you know, Eva, uh, you know, as with all your plays, uh, Network, you, you designed uh, with your partner, uh, Jan Versiewald. Did I pronounce that correctly? No. Uh, no, but the, please. <laughs> <laughs> Would you please pronounce it's it correctly? It's an impossible name. It's, it's Jan Versweifeld. Ver, oh, okay. Versweifeld. Versweifeld? Versweifeld. It is very difficult. Yeah, I'm sorry for yeah. mispronouncing okay. it. But uh, you know, could you talk about the collaboration on uh, on this play in particular? Because what you've done is essentially turn the stage into a kind of working television studio. It's extraordinary. Yeah, and I have to say because you know, it's Jan Versweifeld, it's Tel Jardin for the video, it's Andas, all very uh, difficult names. Yeah. It's Andas for costumes, and it's Eric Schleichem for music. And I have to. Yeah, because it's it's a team, yes. you know. It's not only me. I'm the face a lot and voice a lot, but it's a team, and uh, and a, a team that works together for a long time. With Jan for 40 years, with a lot of others for 20 over 20 years. So it's like a team, uh, and we thought it was very important in this case because it talks about television, but not only television. It's live television. Yes. It's not pre-recorded television. It's like live shows, live TV shows. And we wanted uh, uh, to, to, to give the audience the feeling that you're in the middle of, indeed, a live television show. And a live television show, when it's, we were a little bit late tonight, you know, but normally it would stop, it start at 8. And if you're not there, then there's an empty seat, and the camera is there, and yeah. you're on, and there's nothing happening. So a live television is like a clock ticking until the moment of 8 o'clock, and then it starts. Right. And that thrill, that suspense, that excitement, that energy, we wanted to, to create on stage. And so the whole show, for the people that haven't seen it, the whole production is like uh, uh, there's cameras all the time. You're f the, the, everybody is filmed all the time. We film also. We could also play, therefore, scenes uh, uh, backstage where you normally couldn't see anything. We right. film them there so you can see them. So, you know, it's like a very modern and fashionable word, immersive theater, you know. But, okay, <laughs> but this is really immersive theater because it goes literally outside of the theater and it goes inside of the auditorium you know at a certain moment mm -hmm. and that's the feeling that we wanted to create it was a visceral visceral that you were viscerally amidst a live television show and that everything is almost like television yeah. in this case yeah. does it ever feel like uh, you know cheating at all in terms of the rules of live theater or what we've been taught those rules should be that you know there are experiences not just happening you know live in front of you but also on a screen you know at the top of the of the the auditorium and uh, you know you, you're not just paying attention to one screen but multiple screens. Yeah, but that's what I that's what what's so great in theater because it's not just uh, we're not making a movie in the theater. You know what I always do with my my shots are actually a, a little bit ugly, you know, a little bit wrong. In a movie you would never do it like that. Because I want to frustrate you, I, I'm giving my trick away now. Right? <laughs> I shouldn't do that, perhaps. But I'm always giving a, 
part of the information in the video. So if you, as an audience, are tempted to look at the video screen always, you will be, you get frustrated immediately because you, you will miss a lot. And that you, as an audience, you are aware of that in, almost immediately. Like you will have to look live, so you have to make choices all the time. So I create uh, a kind of uh, a use of video where you have to be active. You cannot sit down and watch like this. You know, you really have to be like this, yeah. alert. Otherwise, you will miss. 75% of it. Yeah. Do you watch much TV outside of uh, your, your work? In yeah, I like TV. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to admit. Yeah. You're the first theater director I think I've heard say that he actually likes well, it. I'm not ashamed of yeah. it. No. <laughs> Housewives of Atlanta are no. his favorite. <laughs> Love them. <laughs> That's a lie. <laughs> New Jersey? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, know I mean, cooking, like. cooking shows. Yes. I love, it relaxes me. Yeah. Because right. I can't cook myself. Right. <laughs> so it, I like to see everybody. It's so easy when you right, see, right. look at it. You know? <laughs> so, Brian, your, your acting resume it now includes uh, Lyndon Johnson, as we discussed, uh, of course, Walter White, uh, and now Howard Beale, these uh, volcanic and sometimes explosively uh, angry characters, but you know when I think back, for example, to some of the the first TV roles that I think a lot of people noticed you in, they were often mild mannered, genuinely nice people. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you getting? <laughs> well, so are any are any of them uh, the the real you? Are these all? Uh, facets of, of you. Uh, well, aren't, aren't we all, you know, multi-dimensional? Isn't that our goal? Is to be not, not have one kind of facet to your life, but, but many. Um, you know, uh, I. One of the, the the most fun I've ever had on a set was in a in a silly little movie called Why Him. Now. And I turned that down three times <laughs> because, because of the fact that the story was um, a, a Midwestern guy doesn't like the, the, the boyfriend of his d beloved daughter. That's it? <laughs> Comedy happens. But I, did a, but, but I had just done a, a string of dramas, bum, 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 bum. And, and I knew that I needed to, I, I want to keep moving. I want to be the moving target. Anything I've just done, I'll do the opposite of that next. And even if I've never done it before, I want to try something new, uh, things that I, I, I don't know if I can do or not, and, and just step into it. And you'll find out quickly right. <laughs> if you can. Um, so to, I mean, to, to channel or to, you know, to get yourself to produce, you know, the, the, at times, the real fury that is coming out of uh, Howard Beale. I mean, does it have to come from a, a personal place necessarily, or is that just something that you can physically do? There are, to me, uh, in my, I, I've, I've kind of been like a, a rummage kind of learner in this, because I, I I went to two years of college to become a police officer, and that didn't pan out because uh, I discovered in my one acting class in college that I, it, uh, it, girls and and so <laughs> uh, it was. The, I thought, oh my gosh, this is the best thing in the world. <laughs> and you're 19 years old. It was so I, I switched, and then and I rode around the country for a little bit and then came back and I said, okay, if I'm gonna do this, I really need to learn how to do this and do it, do it well or I'm just fooling myself. And um, so I think what I gain from that is that there are basically four things that you, you need to be able to uh, create a character. You need to have some talent. And I tell this to young acting students all the time, if I ask you if you have talent, you better say yes, or else you're wasting your own time. So it's not a it's not a brag, but it's a sense of confidence that I I feel I can do that. But more than that, you you need to have an insatiable curiosity. So you're doing a character, 
uh, that you may not, oh, LBJ. I, I spent so much time in Texas and reading every biography I could on the man because that character was so outside of me. And the more I felt I worked, the more he came closer. And at some point, just felt like through osmosis, for lack of a better term, he came in. Um, so it's, it's, the, it's the, the, the willingness and desire, the hunger to do the work, the, the, the research. The, the third thing is probably the most emotional, uh, and that is to open up the cavity of your own life and be willing to show all the negative traits that you have, uh, jealousy, rage, um, uh, uh, sadness, you know, anger, what, whatever, the, whatever the feeling is appropriate, and be willing to share that with everyone. <laughs> well, you know, you have to be to say, here's when I'm at my most vulnerable. And the fourth thing that ties it all together is your imagination. So if you're playing a murderer, you do not want to go out and murder someone so that <laughs> you have that life history. Now I can play that role because I just, uh, so you have to imagine what would make someone do that and you connect those four things together. And that's what I look for each, each time I start to create a character. Yeah. You were talking about uh, anger, and of course, you know, one inescapable point that uh, Network makes is how angry we are. And we were angry when the movie came out. Here we are 42 years later. We're just as angry now, if not angrier. I was around 42 years ago. Oh. I was an angry baby. <laughs> <laughs> But we, as people- you probably had a full diaper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you said that, I'll let it go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to be told that by Brian Cranston is actually very flattering, thank you. <laughs> but you know, here we are, and, and it doesn't feel like the anger has subsided. It feels like we are ang just as angry, if not angrier. We, you know, that's part of why uh, a play like this is uh, still uh, so potent. Uh, what is, in 30 seconds or less, what is the solution to our, to our anger? How do, we, how do we deal with this? How do we solve this? Well, I will say that, that in, in this version, I didn't really realize this during the, uh, the London version, but something occurred to me while we were rehearsing this version of, of the play, and that is the value, the intrinsic value of anger. It's an emotion that is not socially acceptable. We will accept pro probably anything. Um, melancholy, irritability, intolerance, you know, to certain degrees. But someone displaying public anger is shunned. And if, if we can get our audience to scream out, I'm mad as hell, I'm not gonna take it anymore, in some honest way, I think it helps. The, think of the last time that you blew your top, and it didn't solve the problem. I'm not saying it's the panacea, but there's something about letting the pressure out and then calming down, taking some breaths, and then approaching that problem again now without that kind of pressure cap that was putting it. So I think that's what's happening here. And, and anger is probably if you're feeling anger and, and anxiety right now, why not let, some, let it fly? People are doing that all the time on social media yeah. and emails and things like that, but maybe publicly it's not a bad idea. Interesting, yeah. Eva, what about from, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, hopefully a little more perspective uh, on this or more than, uh, you know, uh, Americans uh, can see themselves. Uh, you know, uh, how much trouble are we in as a country? <laughs> <laughs> You're not serious. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I live here also partly, yeah. so I, I spent as much time as possible in New York, uh, actually. Uh, and I, I, you know, I saw a lot, of, but I'm here only sometimes uh, months not, and then I'm back. And, and I saw things change over the last years, of course, but I, on different levels. Uh, for instance, when I, um, I was a little bit shocked, I can say, when, when the elections were there, I was making 
a crucible when, when, the, when the debates were happening within the Republican uh, Party, you know. Uh, but then afterwards, I was gone and I came back and then there was it full election time. And then I saw how and Fox, which, because I, I look at Fox, but also at CNN, both of them, that the same incident I watched there, and it was like an opinion, and it was, I watched there, it was a totally different opinion, but it was both opinions. So also, for instance, CNN moved on in a few months towards very opinionated towards certain position, which I wasn't used that much uh, with CNN. CNN felt for me like a little bit more giving the news, you could say. And suddenly it became opinion. And, and now also because, in, and I understand it, but all the news shows now, they start with a speech from, <laughs> a speech from the news anchor about what he thinks about it. Uh, we are not that far in Europe at, that moment, at this moment, but of course it's also happening. So that's a little bit, well, scary to me in a way that there is no guideline anymore. And that's, I think, the most important thing. For me, it's about leadership. Yeah. You know, it's, at the end of the day, we are in a, in a, in a, in a also in Europe, eh, because in France, you, you know, they're breaking down Paris every weekend, eh, the, the yellow jackets, you know, mm. there. Uh, so it's not only here, it's, it's all over the place. I come from Belgium. Belgium, you know, I lived in Antwerp, where in the 90s already, uh, one out of three persons were voting extreme right. Not right, but extreme right. So I, come, I know this very well, but it, it takes leadership, you know, to listen. And I don't know how to do that, because that's, a, that's the trick, of course. The person that, the, the woman or the man that can do that in the future, uh, will be that will create a turning point in the 21st century, I think, because we need somebody that can really listen, but not only give in to the visceral things that we feel and the anger that we feel. Anger has to be uttered, otherwise it becomes like an ulcer. Eh? That's terrible. But but you know, an ulcer can be cured also, and eh? you can you can cure it. And it needs that kind of leadership. I don't know what it is, but I I know that. We're living in times now of extremes. People that want to go back in, into a splendid past where everything was wonderful, which it wasn't, you know, as we all know. And, and other people that say, well, no, uh, shut up, you. We have to go. You cannot ignore, but you can also not, you cannot ignore both ways. That's what I'm trying to say. And of course, it's very general what I'm saying. And, and I don't, of course, I don't have the solution, but I know that we are, in a transition time where something or somebody will come out and guide us a little bit again. I think we need that. Absolutely. And We're it's not only America, it's also Europe and it's also, and we should also not ignore because we, also when I look at television here, you don't see that much about the world on television. Yeah. No. You know, it's scary. You should take care of that. No, we're so insulated. Yes, You're it's only right. about America and sometimes, but it's always linked to America about Russia a little bit and about, you know, but, but and in Europe we have a little, because we are small, you know, we have to, you know, in, in Holland, you know, you have to, you, know, you need something outside of it. <laughs> otherwise, new, new but we know a little bit more about Asia, about, you know, yeah. continent, huge continents. Asia will be a huge power, well, is a huge power and will be a huge power. Russia, we should take we should take it, take them serious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when Brian, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts as well. I mean, when you do a play like this, and for as long as you have now, not just this production, but the London production, and you've internalized it. I mean, does it change the way you think, or open your eyes at least to, you know, how news gets reported to people, and and. Uh, what goes on there? E yes, quite a bit. <laughs> uh, I think I think guidelines should be in place. I think if there's any opinion uttered on any show, it cannot be called news. I think the FCC should step in, and and I don't. That may be oversimplistic in a, in, a, in a in looking for a solution, but there has to be you, you because we get confused with with news now. Everyone's confused, and in the play. Uh, Howard Beale rails at his audience for, for only 3% of you reading books. Yeah. Only 15% of you read newspapers. The only truth you know is what you get on your television. And that's 
true today. It, the televisions are just smaller now, uh, right? And how addicted are we? Uh, uh, it's not just the, the millennials who are addicted to it. We are too. And I think that the lesson, there's so many themes that you can pull out of this play that, that address the addiction to the, the latest technology, um, ascribing to a certain ideology or only listening to CNN or Fox or whatever you happen to ascribe it, just so that you can nod your head and get angry with someone, or you watch the opposition and get angry at them, or you know. So, but I think, I think ultimately it is going to be about leadership and someone who can step up and separate the two parties. Um, playing Lyndon Johnson uh, had a tremendous uh, influence on me as well. He was a master at it, and he. He was able, it was very common in Johnson's days to associate, have drinks, and go to picnics uh, with Republicans and Democrats. It did, they did it all the time. It, I think ha having a cocktail with who you think is your enemy is probably one of the best things that someone can do. <laughs> it's like, because the, the problem is we have made politics and policy a sport in thinking that if I got to win, my team has to win, and if my team doesn't win, they're the winners, and they can't win because they're out to beat us, and all of a sudden this finger pointing goes on. It's like, wait a minute, what, isn't it so frustrating when you hear a good idea, regardless of what side it came from, and one side can't, oh, it's a good idea, but we can't support it because he's, he or she's from the other side. It's like, this is insanity. It, and, and so I think that's the mentality that we've come into this sporting event kind of thing. And if it, 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 there has to be only one winner sort of thing, it's ridiculous. Yeah. What do you think, you know, what role does, does you know, drama uh, play in all of this? And, you, and your play in particular, does it, uh, you know, is, is it meant to be instructive? Is it meant to just sort of provide uh, a couple hours of uh, relief from a world like the one that you, we've been describing? Is it, does it have any lessons that we can then kind of take out? when we? Our, our play specifically yeah, or, or, or plays in general? Yeah, either. I mean, do you think that this play, I mean, it, because it, it's so, you know, as I think we've sort of walked around this idea, but I can, I, I certainly feel comfortable saying it, that this is in, incredibly relevant still for something that was, you know, an idea that was hatched 42 years ago. It, it's, and is set in the year, I suppose, 1975 or so, it still is talking about 2018 and 2019. Uh, so it's, it seems like it definitely wants to say something to uh, a modern audience. It does. I mean, the, the first responsibility that, that any theater piece it has is to entertain. Um, you really, you have to tell a story. And sometimes the story will be cogent and, and have pathos and meaning to it and great, and I think ours does in spades. I think it, it, it's, it hits on so many different levels. It's, there's one passage when, when Howard Beale says, um, uh, talking about the power of television, and he says, and woe is us if it ever falls into the hands of the wrong people. And it was like, <laughs> and you can hear the audience go, oh. It's like, it's just, it's pretty astonishing, all the different things, you know? And, and, and we, want, we want our leaders to be honest with us. We want the, the news to be honest. And it's, it's harder and harder to find outlets that we feel are being straight with us. And, and so the, those, the, those entities that do need to be celebrated. Is this something you wanted to speak to, Eva, or do you want to let the play speak for itself? But, but, and on, you know, I think for me anyway, like the huge advantage of theater in the arts you know, today and also in the future, I think, is that it's live. He will be there tomorrow live. Oh, no, actually. No, no, you will be there live. Yes. You will be there live. I, I got a thing, yeah. <laughs> but you shouldn't underestimate in the times that we live in where you can, 
you can have every entertainment, pure entertainment at home, you know, on your cell phone, wherever, in, in the subway, you know, everywhere for almost nothing. To go to the theater and pay a lot of money, I think we have a duty, yeah. you know, to give you something which is really special and unique, something that you cannot get at home on your cell phone, your iPad, your whatever it is, you know? That's what our... It's so therefore, I think that the, 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 the future of the theater is wonderful, you know, in the 21st century. Because otherwise, everybody has said it will not survive, you know? It will survive and we will, we will be in the Champions League with the theater. As long know? as we can make it more affordable yeah. and, and have access yeah. to more people. That's, what, that's true. Well, actually, in Europe, it is affordable. It is, yeah. You know, it's like, actually, you would consider it really cheap. When you come to Amsterdam, to my theater, which is the national theater of Holland, whatever it means, <laughs> but then the, the, if you come to a really successful show, you know, you, have the, you pay the highest price is then 49 euros, which is the same as dollar these days. Wow. 49. I don't think you can get on the third balcony here for 14 <laughs> But also, it's like, here's the sense of it. Your actors do five performances a week or, yeah. or so? Yeah. yeah. It's a different system. And of course, it's a subsidized system, I have to say. Yeah, but, but here also, Texas, you know, it's always like you say that, yeah, but it's subsidized. But here it's also subsidized because we, have a, we don't have the system of sponsorship and of people that are giving that that have an obligation also in society to give money back yeah. to society. We have that, but in a small amount, you know, it's not comparable. So, you know, it's, you know, people pay taxes in Holland much more than they do here in order that we can have uh, health security, social security, I shouldn't mention it here, but healthcare, uh, healthcare social, <laughs> social security, and also arts, you know, for instance. And that's a huge thing, I think, in Europe. That's a, that's a, that's a blessing. And therefore, people also, you know, young people that are in school, they can, they can afford to go to the theater because we give them tickets for 10 euros or something like right. that. It's a limited amount, but there is, and they have good seats. So they, I, in my theater anyway, I have the policy, you know, that they don't go to the third balcony. They can sit on the best places. Uh -huh. And then somebody else pays a little bit more next to him or her, you know? So it's a little bit more a democratic system for arts. <laughs> What's that like? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We have time to uh, take some audience questions, and I believe what's going to happen is they will set up uh, microphones in, uh, in the aisles. Uh, and then if folks that have questions just want to line up at the microphones, uh, and we'll just try to get to uh, a few folks if we can. OK. There we go. Let's start with this gentleman here. Go ahead, please. May I? Yes. Yes. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you very much on your night off for doing this. This is fabulous. Thank you. I'm asking this. This is under the auspices of I know that there's always a pull between commercial success and art. When you were creating this, was there ever a time where you, was, you would say, you know what, the hell with the bucks, we're going to do this because we're, we're, we're adhering to what I feel and what many people feel is an iconic piece of American writing? Or the other way, saying that, no, we can't really stick to this because we have to make a buck. How did you even broach that? Did you even look at that? That, of course, you want to be commercially successful, but you want to adhere to Chayefsky's writing? Well, for me, I just make the play I want to make in the way that I think I should do. <laughs> That's what I'm concerned. So, you no, know, I, I got too old to give in before I start to all kind of circumstances and conditions, you know, I don't do that. I, and, but the thing is, I only do a play or a text which I really want to do, with, which I'm not 100% convinced of, but 200% convinced of, hmm. you know, that, that I think that can really make a difference. That's what I try to do. So all the other things doesn't, don't concern me. And I try to find the best actors, and I have the best team, and we try really to, it's a little bit the same as what Brian was saying, we prepare very well. So I, I don't come to the first rehearsal looking what is here, you know, and, and trying to figure it out during the rehearsals. We have also a plan, right? you know, a roadmap. 
we go somewhere, and the w it's also what Brian referred to, the way to go there, you can go by plane that goes quick, you know, by train, you see a little bit more, huh? or you can hike, you know, you can, there's different ways to get to that place, but we have to get to that place. So if he would end up, you know, in Bulgaria, and I said, <laughs> we're going to, you know, to Miami, well, that's, that, that is bad news. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we kind of got spoiled in, in London at the National Theatre because um, they're a great group to work with. They f care first and foremost, and secondly and thirdly, about putting on a great production and giving us whatever we needed to do that. Uh, they're very generous and very supportive, and that's what we did, to be honest. I don't know how much money I made doing that play over there. I don't know how much money I'm making doing the play here. My agent does. <laughs> but we, we, uh, we, when we wanted to move it here, and we wanted to move it here because it belongs here. It was born here. It's a New York story. It's an American story. Very much so. And so we, we really desperately wanted to do it. And it came to a point pull back the curtain for you a little bit, where they said, I don't think we can make it work financially. I don't think we can make it work. And we're like, oh no, why? Well, how, can we, how can we do this? And so um, we just told our agents, make it work. Just, you know, and so everybody got, we got our, our pay cut from whatever it was to whatever it is now is, is what happened. And, and b because you don't do theater to make money. <laughs> that's like, <laughs> that's just a, a terrible idea. It's a terrible plan. <laughs> so, so we don't. It's great to hear, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I just, if, I'm sorry to interrupt before you ask your question. I should have said this earlier. Uh, it's some people in this room probably have not seen the play yet, so just uh, no uh, spoilers in your questions, please. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you, gentlemen. It's a marvelous play. But I wanted to ask you, Brian, you gave us a choice this evening, or you seem to imply a choice that the audience view Howard Beale as either mad or enlightened. And I'm wondering why we can't see him as both. I saw him as mad, mad, and enlightened, because are not many enlightened people mad? And sometimes does not enlightenment cause one to go mad? That's great, great point. So I'm Yeah, it's not, uh, I didn't mean it was either or, it's a spectrum. So every, every audience member uh, is in a different place on that as far as how they interpret the, what they just witnessed and how they felt about it. Our job is to hope that we get you on that spectrum. My, my feeling is that if, an, if the audience leaves the theater and, and begins a conversation about what they just experienced, that we've really done a, a, our job. And, and, and everything's fair. Again, the audience is never wrong. Someone could say, God, I hated that piece of crap. And it's like, and have someone else go, oh, I loved it. Why did you hate it? Why? And both arguments are valid. So it's not, you, of course, you hope that your story that you really believe in is being told well and that it's being received and, and appreciated and makes people think and feel and, and hopefully take with them and, and begin that conversation. So yes, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. Thank you. In fact, you're always right. <laughs> <laughs> My husband says. <laughs> Thank you very much for your question. Hi, I have a, um, oh. Go ahead. Um, I have a question for Evo. I have to tell you, I left my house at Berkeley, California at 4 a.m. this morning to be here so I could ask you this. Wow. You walk really fast. I should, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Man. So I have to say, I would see absolutely any piece of theater that you direct. I just love So would I. And, um, and I'm really curious about the collaborative process between you and your partner, whose name I'm not going to attempt. <laughs> um, and I'm, when you look at a project, I'm curious if 
one of you influences the other in taking a project or how that works. Um, I, I'm just, I, I, cause I feel like the two of you work so collaboratively and beautifully that I'm just, I'm more interested in that process. Yeah, okay, but like, the, the question is like, do we influence each other? Yes, of course. And uh, that's the moment that we are together because uh, to make a decision about a play or a text is crucial, as I just explained. And I involve Jan immediately uh, in that process. And for instance, and it's a play that's well known here now, it's A View from the Bridge. That's the play I didn't want to do. Yeah. You know, I said no. Uh, when the young Vic uh, uh, suggested it to me, I said, well, and at home, I said to Jan, well, why just do another play? You know, I can do every other play, you know? And he said, Ivo, read it please again, because I think this can be really important. And then I read it again and I said, thank you. I, oh, yeah, this is good, oh, yeah. But still I kept with my opinion and Jan flew in, the dramaturg, you know, to, uh, used everybody to convince me. But it's, it's and at the, at the end of the day, I said to Jan, are you really serious? Or do you really think we can make something? He says, yes, I, I'm totally convinced I did it grumpy the first week, you know, and then two weeks before, if we even went in tech, so it was at only rehearsed for two weeks, uh, he said to me, I think this will be one of the best things we ever did. I said, oh, that's, <laughs> I couldn't just hear it. And he was totally right. So, you know, that's the opposite also happened. For instance, a production that was here this, this, this summer, The Damned by uh, Visconti uh, in, at the Armory, that's the thing I wanted to do. And that he said, no, we're not going to do another movie. On, because he hates to do movies on, on stage because they are not made for the stage. Who, so the, it, for a designer, it's even dif more difficult to invent a world to make it work on stage. Because it, the, the author has never intended it to be on a, on a stage like, and play it in, in one go. You know, uh, And that's what I really wanted to do. And there I convinced him to do it. So, but it's really a discussion between the two of us. Before we really do something, we have to agree. Otherwise, it's not possible. But the process, it's like, you know, it's, it's, we, we do it for 40 years together. So yeah. it's like impossible, you know, for us to, 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 to know who did what. Sometimes he is very influential on, 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 very influential on what I direct. And sometimes I, I influence his lighting. For instance, he is a beautiful. He, he does also the lights himself a lot. It's it's like we don't care whose idea is whose. Yeah. You know, we really don't care. I can I care can less. give you some insight oh, no. to that too. <laughs> the only way that that could work, they have such tremendous respect for each other. It's unbelievable to know someone that well, personally and professionally, and be able to get along. It's a real, it would be a real challenge for most people. It didn't, doesn't seem like it's a challenge, really. They have tremendous respect for each other and care and love, and it, and it really works. And that's why I think it continues to work. He's a lovely guy and an extremely talented designer. Thank you for that question. And uh, sorry to keep you waiting on this. Oh, time. no problem. Hi, guys. Thank you so much. I'm really glad you decided to do a view from the bridge. Just want to say. Um, uh -huh. I, yeah. Okay, thank you. I would love to know what the challenges were with working as you're acting on stage, but you're also being filmed. And I, I imagine that acting on stage and on camera is, are two different things. So I would love to hear about the the challenges of, of calibrating your performance to the camera, but also to the audience and the stage? Well, I'll take it back just a little bit because Evo does something that uh, many theater directors don't do, and that he insists that every actor is off book first day of rehearsal, which is a really interesting thing. <laughs> um, but I love it. <laughs> I really, really love it. We were able to mount the play in about three weeks from the first day of rehearsal with four cameras on stage moving, 20 actors moving and desks moving and things going on. There is also people on stage with us, for those of you who don't know. There are 22 people on stage with us, civilians, who paid a premium ticket to have dinner 
<laughs> and cocktails on stage with us while the play is going on. What could go wrong? <laughs> it, it's really remarkable. And, and so there's a lot, lot to do. Uh, we're also all mic'd. Uh, which I also like, which is also, you're, we're breaking so many theater rules now, it's, <laughs> but. I won't tell on you. Yeah, I, uh, but when you do a, a, an, an intimate scene, but you have to hit the back of that third balcony, an actor is not being honest. That's the point. You're not being honest if you say, I really love you and I want to be your husband for the rest, it's like, <laughs> you, 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 it, you, no, it's like, uh, so being mic'd allows intimacy to take place. And it really, it really does work well. As far as uh, acting to, uh, I don't know, it might be something like what Evo was talking about. You've been doing it so long that you, you, you understand the power of the lens and uh, as when I direct, I, if I'm directing someone who's kind of new to it, I tell them not to act at all. Just think it. Don't try to do anything. Don't do anything. Just think about what your character wants to say at that moment. That's all. And trust that it'll be there. And that's really about it. It's trusting that. Um, so I, I've never seen the play. Uh, so I don't know what's happening behind me and uh, my face on screen and things like that. I just have to keep thinking, what, is, what do I want to say? What do I want to do at that moment? And try to be as honest as possible. But that's where the collaboration comes in. Because I depended on Evo and Jan uh, to be able to say, mm, let's bring, bring that down a little bit. Let's put that on. Or that one could be built up a little more. or so you you can't do it alone, really. You, you need you need that that team around you. Okay. Uh, are you I see we're just running out of time, but are you are you guys are, would you be okay just answering these last two sure, questions? Sure, of course. Okay, yeah, Evo, you made a comment about the news being kind of opinion led, and I'm I'm thinking to Anderson Cooper doing five minutes of commentary before he brings in his contributors. And Brian, you made the comment about how does the FCC regulate news in the modern world? But don't you think there's value in providing? <clears throat> fact-based opinion for Americans to be able to kind of discern what the news is. And I think there's a distinction between fact and fiction versus fact and opinion and being able to provide context. Any thoughts on how we, you know, we're able to do that? It, it, Brian, you talked about a solution. What about making the news commercial free for p potential, making it a public service versus a, a for-profit endeavor? Any thoughts on the PBS, value? PBS, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Any, any thoughts on the context of, on the value of, of context uh, versus solely just providing facts and numbers and letting the reader or the Americans decide for themselves? Do you think they're smart enough to decide for themselves? <laughs> That's to you. <laughs> What's to me? Brian, like your answer as well on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's alternative facts now. <laughs> I just, I, I, it's hard to find. I, I, I find that PBS uh, is, is a place that I go that I feel, I, I hope that I'm getting it straight. And, and, you know, you have to look for those places. I think the most important thing is to not just rely on one source. That's the, that's the thing. Don't. Don't ascribe to any one thing. Um, the trajectory of Howard Beale in this play takes the audience on that cautionary tale. It really does. It, because you, you, you listen to him, and he tells you something, and you go, that's, that's true. That makes sense. And then the next speech he has, maybe not so much. And he becomes a different person. Um, so it's it, it's. It's really trusting your instincts and, and expanding, expanding. Don't contract. I think that's probably the key. And don't forget newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I was going to ask a similar question, actually. Um, uh, I saw the movie years ago, and I haven't seen the show. Um, but you were speaking about the manipulation of audiences. But back then, it was manipulation, I think, for purely commercial uh, interest. Whereas today we have a situation where there's a fragmentation and people are getting their news from whatever source reinforces it. And I was going to say, do you think that there is any lesson uh, for journalism today 
in, in your production and your performance? Oh, you mean the enemy of the people? <laughs> I'm all ears. I'm ready to learn. <laughs> it's brutal. We're in a brutal time, man. It's tough. I think I, I think plays like ours that just we we we're in the zeitgeist of it, and it. I, I think people leave that theater. There's something that happens at the end of the play that makes people scream and yell. <laughs> and 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 say I'm mad as hell or use the F word or I mean it's like there's there's something that goes on that really incites the anger. And it was specifically done so that Evo has this tendency to want to never let you comfortable. Are we in 1975 or are we in 2018? Or we're, we're it's like, yeah, okay, you're where you should be. Where uh, you, so you're thinking this is that's that information was coming out then talking about President Ford and the, uh, being shot at and uh, Patty Hearst. Oh, but then now we're talking about themes that are relevant today. So where am I? I remember when we were in London. There's a scene that happens outside, and we're we're right on the Thames, you know, by the Waterloo Bridge. And and I said, but Evo. It's supposed to be New York, 1975. We're going to see double-decker buses and black cabs. He goes, this is something that I am not worried about. Yes, it's good. <laughs> this is all right. This is... <laughs> and, and so it, it was actually, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't out of uh, disinterest. It was out of, I know, this is what's happening. So, oh, we're in today. So we're, we're outside the theater on 44th Street and... And it's like, but someone is holding up a, a cell phone. Yeah, that's all right. And it's, it's just, it's a blend, it's a mix, and it's a bit uncomfortable for the audience. And I think in a good way. Thank you all so much for your time. And a round of applause, really, for Brian Cranston and Eva Von Hove. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you come see it.